This show is intended for general purposes only as individual situations may vary. Statements made should not be relied upon as recommendations or solicitation. When discussed, past performance is no guarantee or indication of future results. Nelson Financial Planning offers security through Nelson IVS Brokerage Services, member FINRA, and SIPC. Good Sunday morning. This is Bud Hedinger. Next on News Radio 93.1 WFLA, the longest running radio show in Central Florida dollars and cents with my good friend joel garris from nelson financial planning you can call him at the office this week at 407-629-6477 to schedule your free consultation to discuss your retirement plans or you can talk to him right now at 407-916-5400 well good morning ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the program dollars and cents my name is joel garris of nelson financial planning and And we are here in the studios as we have been each and every Sunday morning for, well, about 30 years. Started all those many years ago by my father-in-law, Jack Nelson, when we were known as NIPS, Nelson Investment Planning Services, now uh, a name change, really more for social media purposes over to Nelson Financial Planning a couple of years back, uh, we continue the tradition here on uh, on a clear channel, iHeart Radio station, which we've been on for, I think, all but one of those years. I think uh, one of those years we flipped over to Cox. But generally, we've been here. And the reason for that longevity is, of course, there's always something to talk about. And particularly when it relates to your money, once again, uh, no shortage of topics for the market to digest this past week. Uh, Interestingly, you have almost the polar opposite of the prior week. Still over the same topics, trade war, uh, China, interest rates, all of those Topics still dominate, much like they did the prior week, except that the story on them sort of flip from one week to the next. If you need more evidence as to why you should be consistent on your investments and not try and predict the future of the market or what's going to happen next week... Uh, then I submit for you the past two weeks. The Thanksgiving week, which was obviously a very short week uh, because of the holiday on Thursday. And then, of course, on Friday, the markets, uh, which is the day after Thanksgiving, markets are generally not open the full time. They closed at 1 o'clock. So a short week, basically three and a half days. Uh, it was not a good week, that Thanksgiving week. Uh, it was, in fact, uh, the worst week for the markets in eight months. So you come into this week, and what happens? Well, uh, apparently, uh, the consumer, or, or at least the consumer here in America, is very much alive and well. And they were spending, particularly they were spending on uh, Friday, which is Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, Uh, and uh, going out and spending a bunch of money. And then, of course, on Monday of this week, generally considered to be Cyber Monday, going back to those days when your best Internet connection was generally your office Internet connection. Uh, Today's world, uh, your home Internet connection is probably just as good as your office Internet connection. But be that as it may, uh, the term Cyber Monday evolved uh, because as as the thought being, as people came to work on Monday with that speedier Internet connection at the office, uh, they would start to shop. So between Black Friday of the week before and Cyber Monday of this week, we saw uh, an American consumer that produced a higher volume of holiday sales. So that sort of set the tone for the week. Uh, and uh, so consequently, um, that uh, was a positive tone. And then, of course, uh, middle part of the week, the uh, Federal Reserve chairman 
uh, was uh, was talking and uh, was a little bit more, I guess, dovish as it relates to interest rates, uh, saying that they were just below normal. And so what that meant is that the market responded very strongly this past week. The Dow for this week was up over 1,250 points. It was the best week uh, for the markets since 2000. Now I'm looking for where I saw that number. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, best week for the markets in, since December the 2nd of 2011. So best week for the markets in nearly seven years. And you think you can predict that. But here's, here's the concept, okay? What people often forget. Volatility. When the market has volatility, the very definition, the Merriam-Webster definition of volatility is that there's movement up and down. And I think far too often everybody gets transfixed on the down part. The reality is that there's also an up part. And the past two weeks gave you a classic definition of what volatility really is. Down one week, worst in eight months. Next week, up, best in seven years. So be careful of that. Now, is it the same headlines facing us? Absolutely. Absolutely just a different perspective on those headlines. We'll see how that plays out. Obviously, this weekend uh, is a big weekend because uh, you've got the G20. And so at the G20, the theory is that um, you're going to have uh, Trump and and leader of China, Xi, uh, meet. And, uh, and I guess they did that last night. Uh, some of the reports coming out saying, you know, you know fi- fine enough meeting. I think at the end of the day, um, they are still talking, which is, I guess, really what the markets want to be comfortable with is that, in fact, uh, both China and the U.S. are at least talking uh, and ultimately um, winding up being a a little bit of a – um yeah a little bit of a progress if you will or a postponement on the um traditional timing of when those tariffs were going to kick up because remember right now tariffs are at 10% in January they're expected to click up to 25% and if you're if you kind of keep score at home there's a pretty significant difference between 10% versus 25%. So uh, that's why I think the purpose of the conversation between China and the U.S. is to maybe pull the brakes back a little bit because I don't think anybody really wants to see those tariffs go to 25%. 10% uh, is is not good either, but 10% is a little bit more palatable, I guess, or, or livable. Uh, for a period of time. So we shall see kind of how all that plays out. Obviously, the market will be looking to that the beginning part of this week in terms of how uh, that all uh, works works out. Um, so those are the numbers to kind of keep track of. And certainly this coming week, uh, you're going to see much of the same headlines dominate. As we mentioned, uh, the G20 summit happening this weekend. Uh, also, on Wednesday of this coming week, the Federal Reserve Chairman uh, takes his usual position in front of the Congress to testify on uh, the economic outlook. So uh, I'm sure the markets will be following that one very, very closely uh, during the course of, of the week ahead. Uh, in other news, of course, uh, you've uh, had the, the story about GM break. And uh, the uh, Michael Cohen guilty plea as well. So we'll we'll see we'll see how all of the rest of those headlines uh, play out along the way. Uh, certainly, the the Cohen uh, guilty plea uh, could be uh, could be a an interesting one to see how that plays out and whether that affects um, President Trump or 
not. I think the Democrats taking control of the House, uh, we'll go, we're going to hear a whole lot more about that over the next couple of years. Remember, though, anytime there is political infighting in Washington, that, in fact, is sort of the happy formula for the market. It means that basically nothing is going to get done too dramatically that's going to affect the overall the overall policies and rules and regulations that uh, exist. So for from a business perspective, it actually works uh, de- decently enough uh, when you have kind of that split situation. And in fact, if you look at the previous time where you had this particular combination, Republicans controlling Senate, Democrats controlling House, and a Republican in the White House, you have to go back a few years uh, for that specific com- combination to 1981 to 1986. So it's been a number of years since you've seen that kind of combination of D's controlling the House, R's in, controlling the Senate, and a Republican in the White House. Uh, just so if you don't recall who was at the helm in 1981 through 1986, that would be the first six years of Ronald Reagan's eight years in the White House. So we'll see if the re- economy produces the same results that it did from 1981 to 1986, because if you look in your history books, it was a pretty decent time for the economy and the market. So stay tuned, I guess, on all of that. But interestingly, that's the last time we saw this particular combination was in that six-year period of time uh, during uh, during the Reagan years uh, back in the early 80s. So we'll see if uh, if history repeats itself with this particular combination. I suspect... What will be different is that the House will spend a tremendous amount of time trying to throw uh, dirt at 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 uh, at the president uh, in hopes of uh, some of it sticking, or and and where that goes from there. I, I I think you'll you'll hear and you'll see a lot of these folks in the House just looking to 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 throw dirt uh, and investigate, investigate, investigate. So. We will see how that all plays out over the next couple of years. Uh, And, of course, we will be talking about it on the radio program. Again, the historical reference point, and we've shared this before with you, uh, if, if, if these investigations that the House plans on doing ultimately lead to something, and what they would lead to would be an impeachment trial, um, guess what? Last impeachment trial was Bill Clinton in the 12 months leading up to the impeachment trial itself. The market went up 25 percent. So before you get too hung up on politics affecting the market, simply consider some of the statistics that we've shared with you. It really does boil down to the kind of the one, the off and the on headlines. Tariffs and interest rates are are kind of the two chief topics for consideration. That is for sure. Uh, Anyway, we're going to slide to a break. We get back from the break. We will uh, talk about uh, some of the things to be thinking about coming into the end of the year, particularly from a tax perspective. My goodness, there's a lot of tax changes for next year. You know, we were in the process of trying to get organized for uh, some of the communications that we send out here at the end of the year, beginning of next. And uh, we were talking about, you know, we usually put together like a top 10 tax list. Well, lo and behold, uh, we didn't actually do one last year, which is the first year in a lot of number of years that we didn't do one uh, because uh, there were changes. But all of those changes were set for this year. So the reality is, though, that this year there's going to be a whole lot more uh, certainly to talk about with those changes. And we'll start to talk about some of them when we get back here on Dollars and Cents. This is Joel Garris, Nelson Financial Planning. News Radio 93.1 WFLA. 
This is Bud Hedinger. You know, you can talk to Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning right now on Dollars and Cents about anything to do with your money by calling 407-916-5400. Give him a call. It's time to make sense of your dollars. Welcome back to the program, ladies and gentlemen. Dollars and Cents here on News Radio 93.1 WFLA. Also simulcasting over there for our friends on the AM dial at 540 AM, this part of the program, we're going to be chatting a little bit about some of the tax things to consider, particularly as you get into the end of this year, looking ahead to next year. Uh, as I mentioned before the break, we'll be uh, certainly needing to put together our top 10 our top ten tax changes. Really wasn't hardly anything this year, uh, but next year, yeah, there's a whole lot of them. So we're going to be putting them together uh, and uh, probably get them out uh, sometime during the course of the month of January, which uh, right around the corner, right? Uh, my goodness, it's already December. So we're going to, uh, I am sure, rapidly accelerate to the end of the year, and then it will be January and tax time before before we all know it. So um, that's what's on uh, ta- tap for the rest of the program Today, we also have room, though, for your topic. So uh, I'll give out those numbers again. I know Bud gives them out in that bumper spot that uh, has us uh, just before we join the program. But uh, we will give them out again, 407-916-5400, toll-free, 1-866-916-5400. Those are the numbers to call on in and be a part of the program. Also, uh, you can send us an email. That's the other way to do that. If you don't want to necessarily get on the air, you want to just send us an email. The email is my first name, Joel, J-O-E-L, at nelsonfinancialplanning.com. Those are uh, the ways in which you can get in touch with us and add your topic in uh, to our list of topics for this morning's program. So, uh, obviously, one of the biggest changes next year is this notion uh, that the standard deduction is going up and going up dramatically. Uh, in fact, uh, the standard deduction for married couples is going to be 24000 If you're over 65, you get to add, uh, I think it's around 1000 or 1200 to that number. So, it, it winds up going up to just over 26000 in terms of the standard deduction. Single filers. Uh, your standard deduction is 12000 Okay, so what does that really mean? Well, for the roughly 30% of people out there that itemize their deductions, if we look at, at the traditional tax code uh, and we look at 100 sample returns, what you would find under the old tax laws is about 30% went through the process of itemizing their deductions, which means that things like your mortgage interest or your medical expenses or your real estate taxes or your charitable contributions uh, or or your unreimbursed employee expenses, things like that all kind of got morphed onto a separate schedule and you use that as your write-off because that number was, of course, greater than the then current standard deduction. However, now that um, you've got a much higher standard deduction, uh, it is estimated that of those 30 returns uh, out of 100, that 30 uh, percent, that uh, 24 of those 30 or I mean, nearly 80 um, percent uh, will find that it just doesn't make any sense to go through that exercise because the standard deduction is as mu- is so much higher than it previously was. So the number of itemized filers will drop pretty significantly the vast majority of people will be doing a standard deduction. And um, there's a couple of reasons for that, obviously, beyond just the increase in the standard deduction. There's also limitations. There's limitations of your ability to deduct state and local income taxes. Uh, That's capped at $10,000. Also, many of the deductions were eliminated. Things like unreimbursed employee expenses, that deduction was eliminated. Uh, investment advisory fees, that deduction was also eliminated. Tax prep fees, also eliminated. There was a bunch of deductions that were eliminated and others 
that were in fact wound up getting limited in terms of the amount that you could in fact deduct. About the only one that actually wound up changing in your favor, okay, well, no, this one didn't even change because uh, in 2018, um, the uh, the deduction for education expenses was uh, set at dropped down to seven and a half percent. It was it did go up to ten. It dropped down to seven and a half. But then for 2019, the deduction reverts to the previous limit of the ten percent of adjusted gross income. So so there's there's not. I mean, if you had deductions, you're not getting nearly like what you did. And now with the higher standard deduction, then at the end of the day, many will find that they're just going to be taking the standard deduction. So so how do you do that analysis? OK, how do you do that analysis? Because it will be a very time consuming or time saving analysis if you can do it. And obviously, when you do it. You want to make sure that you're doing it accurately. So, so you're, if you're if you have been itemizing, you're hearing all this conversation, much like we just talked about, on whether you should be itemizing or whether you should be doing standard. And if you're going to do the standard, well, then you can save yourself a whole lot of time and effort to track down your medical expenses or your real estate taxes or your sales tax or your charitable contributions. I mean, it takes time to track all that stuff down. So. How do you go through the process of determining, okay, wait a minute. Do I really need to repeat all of my efforts from previous tax years and gather up all this documentation? Or, okay, do I just take the standard deduction and not worry about it? So here's how you do that analysis. And this is very important. So take a look at last year's tax return. Okay, take a look at last year's tax return. And look at Schedule A. Okay, that's your itemized deductions. Okay, first part is going to be your medical expenses. Take a look at those. Okay, remember, okay, medical expenses, the ability to deduct them is subject to getting over a 7.5% adjusted gross income threshold. So if your income is $100,000, you've got to have medical expenses of at least 7,500. Okay, but it doesn't just end there. If you have, say, 8,000 of medical expenses, then guess what? You only get to write off 500. You only get to write off the amount over that threshold. Just because you get over that threshold doesn't mean that all all of the medical expenses below that threshold you get to write off. That's not how it works. The amount over that threshold is what you get to write off. Okay, so there's medical. So look at that and think, okay, were my medical expenses the same? Were they different? Were they higher? Were they lower? Did I even get a chance to write off medical expenses last year? Okay, so that's first thing. Next, real estate taxes and sales tax. Okay, so how much was all of that? Did all of that add to more than $10,000? Because if it did, well, wait a minute. Now that's only limited to $10,000. So then you look at that sales tax, that real estate taxes, all of that next little category on Schedule A is where you would then kind of start to look at that and what those numbers are. Like most people, unless you picked up an extra property or you spent a bunch of money on sales tax or whatever, eh, that should probably stay relatively the same from one year to the next. Same thing is true for the next category. That's mortgage interest, right? So pretty much same thing, you know. So now you're kind of looking at these numbers. Okay, well, that that didn't that didn't change, or maybe that changed a little bit. Charitable contributions is the next one. Charitable contributions. Okay, so last year I did X. Well, this year I did roughly about X. Okay, so or maybe you decided to make a, a much larger charitable contribution than you did this past year. So that's the next piece that you would look at. The last piece you would look at on Schedule A is that unre is is those various miscellaneous expenses. Those miscellaneous expenses, for the most part, all of those were eliminated. So if you took a deduct, if you had a deduction last year, chances are it's going to be zero anyway. Okay, so now that you've kind of looked at last year's tax return, kind of done that sort of competitive uh, analysis on what your expenses were 
in 2018 versus 2017. Now let's add it up. Okay. If you're below 24 grand by, you know, three, four grand, uh, it's time to just stop the analysis right there. Don't bother to gather up all of those documents that you otherwise would in January and just go with, hey, I'm taking the standard deduction. If you're close within a couple of grand, three grand or something like that, then it may make sense for you to kind of pull all of that together and just see. The reality is, though, once you start pulling some of that stuff together, you should be pretty should be pretty easy to decide, wait a minute, I'm still a couple of grand below that standard deduction. Uh, I'm going to stop my gathering process in January and just say, hey, I'm going with the standard deduction. Because understand the numbers that we said at the beginning of the segment. 80% of itemized deduction filers in the past are going to find that they're better off as a standard deduction. So the odds are very much in your favor that you're probably going to wind up with the standard deduction. Now, if you look at last year's tax return and you had 25,000 of itemized deductions or 30,000 of itemized deductions and they weren't all concentrated in those other categories that have been eliminated or they weren't all uh, concentrated in the, the state income tax sales tax deduction location, then, okay, that's easy. You know you have to still do your homework come January. But that would be the analysis that you want to do to determine this whole notion of do I itemize, do I take the standard, and how do I ultimately gain that time-saving element that comes with uh, this notion of a higher standard deduction. So certainly uh, a worthwhile uh, analysis to do uh, to go through that process um, in, uh, in, in, in detail. Again, using last year's Schedule A uh, as your template document. And if you're still, if, if you're three, four grand below that 24,000 number, then you know what? Forget it. It's not worth the effort. Just go ahead and take that standard deduction. So uh, certainly some things to, to be thinking about, especially as we get to the end of the year. When we get back from the break, we'll talk about a very important tax trick involving your charitable contributions that would still make things possible to get a tax benefit on a charitable contribution regardless of whether you itemize or not. So we'll hit that when we get back here on Dollars and Cents. This is Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning on News Radio 93.1 WFLA. This is Bud Hedinger. You know, you can talk to Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning right now on Dollars and Cents about anything to do with your money by calling 407-916-5400. Give him a call. It's time to make sense of your dollars. Hey, welcome back to the program, ladies and gentlemen. Dollars and Cents went a little long in that last segment, but I think that that was uh, an important a topic to, or, or an analysis to describe because it's one that you're going to have to be facing very, very soon. And, and the biggest change in the tax code is this notion of this much higher standard deduction. So the analysis or the time-saving aspect uh, to that notion of that higher standard deduction will only come to your benefit if you do a very simple analysis beforehand. And that analysis simply requires you to look at last year's Schedule A, which is itemized deductions, and just sort of run through the categories as to uh, what, if any, were the changes and understand that the miscellaneous deductions have effectively all been eliminated and the deduction for state and local in taxes have also been capped at 10000 Knowing that, should be able to run through that uh, analysis relatively easily and determine whether you're close at all to having to redo or, or pull together all of your deductions to itemize for um, this calendar year's tax return 2018. Uh, the vast majority of folks that itemize in the past will not be itemizing in the future. So if you want to pick up that time-saving opportunity, uh, then you've got to actually do a little bit of homework 
uh, ahead of time by looking at Schedule A uh, and determining uh, what that what that number is. We mentioned before the break that we we're going to mention again uh, a very powerful opportunity if you make charitable contributions, particularly here at the end of the year. There's always that push to make charitable contributions. Uh, the reality is that um, yeah, by doing those through your required minimum distribution then and doing them directly to the charity, that's the catch. You can't take your required minimum distribution, put it in your bank account, and then write a check to, say, your church or fair, favorite charitable organization. That will not work. The, the, the check has got to come directly from your IRA, be part of your required minimum distribution, your age over age 70 and a half required minimum distribution, and then uh, be directed as a check payable to that charitable institution. If you do that, regardless of whether you itemize or not, then you get to offset that charitable deduction amount against the amount of income that you have to report as a uh, as a required distribution from your IRA. So some pretty interesting stuff there, uh, particularly as it relates to donating and making the donation to your uh, favorite charity, uh, regardless of whether you itemize. And there's a there's a school of thought out there that's concerned that this higher standard deduction will have a little bit of a wet blanket effect on making charitable contributions uh, to organizations because uh, you don't get to have uh, that tax benefit, if you will. Well, the reality is that that tax benefit, uh, because if you're taking a standard deduction, then you don't wind up getting uh, a, an immediate write-off on that. that. That tax benefit can be certainly offset uh, through the use of the required minimum distribution and having that required minimum distribution go directly to the charity. So uh, certainly some things to uh, be thinking about as it relates to uh, the new tax law, particularly as um, particularly looking at uh, the ability to make charitable contributions and to be looking at those uh, those types of 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 numbers. So um, in terms of other changes uh, that uh, are certainly uh, worth considering here at the end of the year, Perhaps one of the biggest things is uh, capital gain distributions and uh, capital loss opportunities. So uh, capital gain distributions uh, typically happen during the month of December. Um, and in a year like this, uh, it can create some tax consequences, even though uh, the performance for the year, for the calendar year, has not been particularly uh, good. The year uh, effectively has been relatively mixed in terms of uh, returns, particularly uh, because of the volatility, uh, because of the uh, volatility that happened uh, during this last quarter of the year. Uh, that's important to know the timing of that because that presents a little bit of an odd uh, situation. One that the reality is we really haven't seen. Uh, the only other times we sort of really saw it was more, well, 2001 in particular, or actually 2000. Uh, the other time would have been, uh, to a lesser extent, in 2008. And that's the notion of the timing of when capital gain distributions are calculated uh, versus uh, when uh, they are paid out. So we'll talk a lot more about that in the last segment of the program. So we're going to slide to the break. When we get back from the break, we'll talk much more about this timing issue and how it can affect your taxes and how in particular during the course of the month of December here, uh, those capital gain distributions uh, will in fact uh, start to show pretty uh, pretty dramatically uh, in, in, in many cases. So uh, we'll talk more about that when we get back from the break after these messages here on Dollars and Cents. This is Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning, News Radio 93.1 WFLA. 
This is Bud Hedinger. You know, you can talk to Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning right now on Dollars and Cents about anything to do with your money by calling 407-916-5400. Give him a call. It's time to make sense of your dollars. Welcome back to the program, ladies and gentlemen. Dollars and Cents. Yes, indeedy. Not too late to join in on the conversation uh, 407-916-5400, toll-free 1-866-916-5400. You can also send us an email. That email is my first name, Joel, J-O-E-L, at nelsonfinancialplanning.com. So that's how you can add your topic in uh, to this segment of the program. Uh, otherwise, you'll have to wait for next week. Um, anyway, so... Before the break, we were talking a little bit about capital gain distributions. As the calendar turns to December, that is when you will see capital gain distributions for most mutual funds. And so what what is setting itself up this year is something that we saw an awful lot in the year 2000 uh, to a lesser extent in 2008. And, and that is simply the the calendar working against you as it relates to capital gain distributions because you see in a mutual fund most mutual funds uh sort of close their books on September 30th when they close their books on September 30th uh in order to, for from a tax perspective that's when they start to calculate out uh the tax consequences of activity that happens has happened in the fund over the previous 12 months then they come up with that number, and then they that's distributed out proportionately to all the various shareholders of a particular fund. That payout or those record dates typically occur during the month of December. So just to set the stage, they run the numbers and calculate things on September 30th. They pay it out in December. So what's the problem with that? Well, the problem with that is you got two or three months in between. And if the market doesn't behave very well in those two or three months, then you could very well be looking at, much like a lot of fund owners are, uh, the potential of having a tax issue on a fund that did not perform particularly well for the calendar year. The last time we saw that happen uh, to a great extent, much greater extent actually back then than 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 this year was back in the year two thousand. Uh, in the year two thousand, uh, as they normally do, books closed on September thirtieth, calculating out capital gains. The year uh, two thousand going into September thirtieth, well, pretty good year. Then, what happened was we had that Bush Gore election that was tied. Effectively. And for 35 days, it was up in the air as to what the resolution was going to be. The problem with that is, as you might well imagine, is the market does not like that kind of uncertainty. And during those 35 days, the market went down about 20 or 25 percent. So then it finally gets resolved. Uh, That election wound up getting resolved in early December. But then you now have all of these payout dates, these capital gain distribution dates. Very odd, very weird, uh, and very rare, obviously, for going back to the year 2000 as the, the sort of the last time we saw this happen with any significance. Um, so in that year, you had uh, you know performance that on a calendar year basis was, that was not good. Uh, but yet you then had a capital gain distribution that you had to pay taxes on a report on your tax return and pay taxes on. So fast forward 18 years and uh, we have a similar situation, not quite nearly as dramatic as what happened back in 2000, but same set of, of same setup, if you will. Uh, September 30th, mutual funds close their books, start calculating out September 30th. uh, At that point, uh, overall market was up eight, nine percent for the year so far. So, okay, so everything's looking decent. Uh, start making the calculation. Then along the way, uh, October, November comes in, conversation over tariffs, interest rates, stuff like that. Market goes down. Uh, After last week, though, which, as we mentioned at the top of the program, 
was uh, the best week in the market for since 2011. So for seven years uh, after last week, uh, market's still positive for the year, about 4%. So not quite anywhere comparable to what 2000 looked like. Uh, but still, you wind up not having as much profit as you did at September 30th. Lo and behold, you've got capital gain distributions that are occurring. Uh, and when those occur, you have to report those and pay taxes on your um, on your tax return for that. So that's the setup, if you will. Uh, and there are, are, I think, about 500, over 500 different funds out there, really across the board. Uh, it doesn't matter where you're at, whether they're Vanguard funds, American funds, Fidelity. I mean, across the board, uh, there are some funds that are going to be paying out in excess of 10% of their value uh, on um, on a, a capital gain basis. So... Um, then you really want to be looking at, my goodness, uh, and remember, folks, th- this this analysis only applies in a non-qualified account, right? In a qualified account, it is in, an immaterial conversation because the dividends and capital gains wind up getting reinvested uh, on a tax-deferred basis. So this only applies on non-qualified money, okay? So on a non-qualified account, you're confronted with, okay, now I'm going to have to pay, uh, report and pay taxes on this capital gain, but my performance for the year wasn't anywhere near uh, what uh, my capital gain might be, particularly if you own one of these funds that's paying out more than uh, than 10% of the value. So, because, you know, you may only be up 4 or 5%. So you're only up 4 or 5%, and then all of a sudden you've got to pay a 10% a value capital gain. Well, that just doesn't seem right, right? So what you really want to be looking at, uh, and this really re- relates to, to sort of new money or new accounts that, that, you might have, that you might have established. Because if you go back two or three years, unfortunately, you're still going to have a capital gain, right? If you invested this money uh, prior to 2017, 2017 was a great year for the market. So you're still going to have a capital gain uh, in that account, so you don't want to sell that account because you would have a much larger capital gain than the one uh, that you are going to be facing uh, with the capital gain distribution from the fund itself. So what you really want to be doing is looking particularly at money or accounts that were established over the course of the past, really this year, and looking at those numbers and saying, okay, wait a minute, what uh, what's the situation on uh, on on the value of my account, and what's the situation with respect to the capital gain distribution? Because if the capital gain distribution is, say, for example, greater uh, than the profit that you've gotten in the, the fund, or depending upon the timing of when you actually opened the account or invested the money, uh, that may actually be at a loss, then you certainly want to make an exchange out of that fund and avoid that tax implication. Now, when you make that exchange, you got to be careful of the record dates and the payable, well, specifically the record dates uh, of the fund that you're getting out of and the fund that you're getting into. How you really want to time it is getting out of uh, one f- uh, out of the funds before they pay and then getting into the funds after uh, they've paid. So, very important analysis to kind of try and make on uh, capital gain distributions and how ultimately that plays plays out. So what you really should be doing is looking at newer accounts, things that you might have added money to or established over the course of the past year, and, and look for ways to help minimize that tax issue. I see we had a caller, but unfortunately we're out of time. Caller, if you will... Uh, we can certainly start the program off with this topic next week uh, here on um, News Radio 93.1 WFLA. In the meantime, though, we got to wrap it up. This has been Dollars and Cents. This is Joel Garris of Nelson Financial Planning here on News Radio 93.1 WFLA. Fees, commissions, expenses, investment costs come in all shapes and sizes. Do you know how much your investments are really costing you? 
At Nelson Financial Planning, we believe that costs should be a major consideration in your financial plan. After all, the lower your costs are, the more you get to keep for yourself. This is Joel Garris, and I invite you to get educated about your investment costs. Visit NelsonFinancialPlanning.com or call us today at 407-629-6477 to set up a personal conversation to review your investment costs. That's NelsonFinancialPlanning.com or 407-629-6477 to set up that conversation. A-plus, Better Business Bureau accredited. Nelson Financial Planning offers securities through Nelson IVEST Brokerage Services. Member SIPC and FINRA. Listen to Joel Garris on Dollars and Cents every Sunday at 9 a.m. on News Radio 93.1 WFLA. This show is intended for general purposes only as individual situations may vary. Statements made should not be relied upon as recommendations or solicitation. When discussed, past performance is no guarantee or indication of future results. Nelson Financial Planning offers security through Nelson Ives Brokerage Services, member FINRA, and SIPC. 